Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first DigiGen webinar, which will focus on working qualitatively with small children. I'm Elizabeth, Director of Copa Say Families Europe, one of the project's consortium partners, and I will co-host today's webinar with Ninka, Copa Say's DigiGen Project and Advocacy Officer. So, hi, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good evening to some. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in to our first DigiGen webinar. I would like to go over some quick practical points uh, before I leave the floor to our speakers. So today, um, the panelists and I won't be able to hear or see you, but you can say hello in the chat. Uh, just make sure that you select all panelists and attendees if you would like the other attendees to see your message as well. And if you have questions to the speaker, you can use the Q&A function, which you can find below in the toolbar. Uh, you can ask the questions anonymously if you prefer, because we will be recording, uh, we are recording this webinar, and as Elizabeth said, um, sometime after the webinar, uh, we'll publish it uh, on our channels as well. If you're on Twitter and you're talking about this webinar, please feel free to tag us. You can use at DigiGen Europe or use the hashtag DigiGen Europe. Um, and yeah. So now I would like to give the floor to my dear colleague, Olaf Capella. He's the senior researcher and research coordinator at the Austrian um, Institute for Family Studies at the University of Vienna. He leads DigiGen's work in the focus area of the family, and he will give a quick introduction to our project and the specific segments of our research. Thank you, Ninke. Hello to everybody, and nice to have you with us in our first webinar. Maybe for those, all of those who don't know what DigiGen is, DigiGen is a, a project within the Horizon 2020 of the European Commission. We are focusing on children and young people and their experiences and the role digital technologies is playing in their lives. By doing that, we're focusing primarily on four main areas, which are children and young people are living in. Our work package we will present today is focusing on the family. By that family, we really do understand in a broad definition. We cover family not only as a nuclear family, but we would like to meet all the people which are close to children and which children consider as part of their family. Next to the family, we do look at the leisure time of children and young people of the area. When we do look of educational institutions like school as a very relevant area for young people's life. And then we look at the civic participation of young people um, and their acti activities in civil particip participation. Within the Digitum project, we really try to investigate to gain more understanding what role digital technologies and te uh, digital um, technology plays in their life. Um, for today, we would like to present first results and first observations. We decided to work in digital pretty much with a qualitative method and with a qualitative approach of social sciences. That means we don't conduct very big data and questionnaires, but what we are basically are doing is we conducting focus groups and interviews with children and their family members. By that, trying to understand on the one hand, how do they use and what do they use digital devices for? Are there any negotiations? Are there any conflicts? Um, how is it working? What kind of place does it take in family life and daily? And on the other hand, we are very much interested in um, how is qualitative research working with young children? In our work package in the family, we do look and work with children in the age of five and six and eight to 10 years. That means we really work in a social science segment with very young children. We don't know very much about the qualitative work of children in that age group. And that's the reason why next to the content kind of what role does digital divides play in children's lives, we would like to develop a little bit further. How can we use qualitative research methods in working with those young children? As I said, Please have in mind, we are not presenting results. We are not at the end of our discussions. What we asked our colleagues, all the people you see here on the screen are colleagues from different countries which are participating in the work around the family. And they would like to share all 
with you their first observation and first impressions of how this work, this qualitative work is happening and how it works and what we may have to rethink. Let me tell you, children enjoy the qualitative work with us, but for us as researchers, it's often quite challenging. Challenging in terms of questioning our approach we are used to in qualitative research, questioning ourselves, our attitudes towards children, and really challenging in that way, what does it mean to take children really serious if we are interested in their opinions and in their attitudes. And we would like to get into a discussion with our first observations. And that's the reason why we arranged it like that, that we will have some input from our side. And then you're more than welcome to join and to ask questions that all together we discuss our first observation. I wish you an interesting and a very joyful webinar with us. And thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, thank you, Olaf. Um, as you mentioned, an important aspect of a project is to include uh, children and young people and understand their perspectives on the impact of technology in their lives. And Susanna Fogel is joining us here today to discuss methodological considerations of including young children in our research. Uh, Susanna is a postdoc researcher at the Austrian Institute for Family Studies at the University of Vienna. And she's an expert in social science methodology. Uh, Susanna, the floor is yours. Uh, you can start sharing your screen. Thank you, Ninke. Thank you everybody for joining in. I'm indeed sharing my screen with you. I hope everybody can see the slides now. Just yeah, give perfect. me the, okay, fine. So I can start. Yeah, I'm a methodologist and I'm particularly interested in um, so-called special population groups. One of these special population groups are young children. So the question is, how can we actually research these young children with qualitative methods? A quick outline for what I'm going to tell you is conceptualize or contextualize rather the, the researching children. Then talk about research methods with a focus on interviews and focus groups. As Olaf said, this is part of the work package we're working in, where we're using interviews and focus groups with very young children. Now, to understand um, how methods can be employed with young children, we definitely have to look at the skills these children have and how they develop over the course of childhood or you know, the life course, basically. But in this case, we just look at the children. So a short introduction into, into children's skills and competencies. And then, of course, most relevant for, I guess, us and as empirical researchers, other public the practical implications of all this. Okay, we start at the beginning, researching children. What does it mean? Well, there's something to be noted. There has been a change towards the end of the last century. We could note a shift of paradigm in a sense, uh, with the so-called new childhood studies. This means that during the course of the last couple of decades in the last century, children or the view of children in research changed from children being seen as adults to be, so um, sort of deficient, um, not adult members of society, then became actors in their own right. Now, this was really important for research. When you see that children are actors in their own right, they have their own perspective, and this is a valued perspective. This is not the perspective of somebody that is not grown up yet. This is the perspective of somebody that is actually a full member of society. This then led to a change in the research focus where we are not researching children as the recipients of research, but we actually do research with and for children. Now, this sounds great. You know, we're encouraging, we're empowering children, but this comes with a lot of problems as well, mainly how can we actually capture children's perspective? This is not as straightforward as it might seem. Why? Well, children actually challenge social science scientists because they have different verbal, interactive, and cognitive skills than we would expect from adults. And even more complicating, children amongst themselves. If you think the age group of children, this is from zero to 12 or 13 years. This is a huge disparity in skills across that time span. So you have to be more specific, but even if you're looking at a very specific age group, let's say 
primary school children. Even then, there is a huge variability of skills and therefore the implications for our research methods are we have to be flexible in adapting our methodological approaches to these children with everything that comes with it. So now I told you why it's difficult, but it's worth thinking about how to actually gain the children's perspective because they are usually much more competent than, than we think. And the problem is on our side. The problem is on us. We have to learn how to approach them properly. It's not that they are deficient. We and we as researchers and our methods might be deficient. So the webinar today is actually focusing on what can we do to improve our approaches to even include young children in social science research. So what basically happens when we research children is that we have classic methods, interviews amongst the most classic research methods we know, uh, but sometimes we also modify them to suit whatever we think is um, appropriate for children really. And sometimes, but very rarely, there is a development or specific methods that are meant to target this special population group. What we have to consider, however, for me, key issues. The one is all research approaches are perspectives. This is important because when we conceptualize methods or try to develop and adjust methods, we always have a specific view or image of the people we're trying to address, our research subjects in a sense. Now this view we have shapes the methods we are employing and how we are employing them. But it also has the risk of perpetuating our images. So we have to question what are our expectations of the, of the target group and then be critical about um, the results really. So did we have the right idea or not? So this is something to reflect on rather than take for granted. And of course, our research and research methods are adult centered most of the time, not all the time, but um, we mainly, you know, you put the project that proposed together, you're planning the study, the research design, all this is based on adult thinking and also conducting, in our case now, interviews or focus groups, of course, is adult centered. For that, the generational hierarchy might be very relevant. We put the children that participate in a specific place. So we're trying to empower them, but at the same time, there is a hierarchy inherent in our interaction, um, which we just have to be aware of. We cannot totally eliminate this. And something else about the communication in interviews or um, focus groups as well. This is a typical way of communicating for adults. We talk and we write, but this is not necessarily what children do. So maybe we have to find ways of communicating that are not only based on words and, and written, of course, written interviews are really difficult for preschool children, but even when you have primary school children. So maybe we have to think about approaches uh, that mix other um, aspects of commu communication between beyond words or verbal communication. And um, this I also consider very relevant. It's about equivalence of meaning. So if we take children as actors in their own rights seriously. We also have to acknowledge that they live in a culture of their own or at least a subculture. You know, and therefore communicating about meaning, negotiating meaning could be very crucial. You see it, you know, even if I talk to my teenage um, daughter, she's obviously very, very close to me. So we sort of know what we're talking about, but the language adolescents or teenagers use might be quite different from the words and language we're using. So we have to make sure we're actually talking about the same thing. And again, I'm coming back to a point I made earlier in our methods, we have to be flexible enough to warrant this negotiating of meaning really. Okay, after this, general background of researching children, I now focus on the data collection methods, interviews. What do interviews do? Well, they seem simple and straightforward. You have a question, a research question you want to answer. So ask and you get the answers. So it seems very simple also because this is exactly what we do in everyday life. If you want to know something, just ask questions. 
So the idea would be we have a verbal stimulus, you ask something and you get a verbal reaction. Very straightforward, simple, easy. But of course, not as easy. <laughs> so what is actually communicated in these interview settings is not just an expression of attitudes or um, behaviors that are put in words. It's also a product of the dynamic within this very specific situation. So the people that are engaged in the interview, the interviewee, as well as the interviewer, shape this interaction and therefore the outcome, what is communicated in the interview. And they do this in a very specific context. So the setting of the interview, and this concludes everything from the room, the time, the space, um, what you're wearing, everything shapes the situation in one way or another. So we have to reflect on this. Interviews are interactions and what is communicated depends very much on the specific situation. Interviews are not as simple as they seem. So what I said earlier, you just ask a question, you get a response, yes, basically yes, <laughs> but interviews are also complex. The requirements on behalf of the interviewee are not to be laughed at. You have to handle many different tasks at the same time. Now, we as adults, we're used to this, you know, we're talking to people across the globe, like I do now, also you're not talking to me yet, but <laughs> you know what I mean? So we're, we're used to that. But for children, it's much more complex, particularly in a totally new setting, like an interview. They have no prior experience of interview settings. What they know are school-like settings, or they talk to their parents. And usually, Teachers know the answers, but this is not what we're doing in qualitative research. We don't know the answers. We want to get the answers from the children. So this is something we really have to work on. We have to make clear what we want, what the, expe the expectations are in this um, situation, because for the children, it's really difficult to handle all these multiple tasks going on in a qualitative interview or focus group. They have to not only speak, so language production, they also have to comprehend the language, Plus, they need to have social skills for the communication and they need to have cognitive skills because they might have to remember something, they might have to show abstract thinking, whatever. So this is quite challenging. And we have to make it as easy as possible for the children to give them the best opportunity to participate in the interview research. Okay, focus groups compared to interviews have the strength that you have more people participating so it's not a, a group interview focus group is much more than just having more people in the same room to interview it's actually a focus on the participants interacting among its each other and therefore taking them um how would i say the emphasis away from the adult interviewer or in this case you would say the moderator so with that approach with the interaction among the peers the participants you can explore new topics and generate new hypotheses. And you might get a wider spectrum of opinions because the people are interacting amongst each other and it's not so unidirectional with the interviewer and the interviewee. And the idea is also to increase the external validity. This means that um, the setting in the peer group is like in real life or closer to real life than an interview setting with a stranger. And therefore, what the children in this case communicate is more relevant to their everyday life and therefore the external validity is higher. So the, these are the um, upsides, but of course there are downsides as well. The downsides are that the communication process as such can also be a potential threat to the validity and the group dynamics can inhibit communication. This means that um, you have a peer group, but there can also be peer pressure to say something or not say something, or to say something in a very specific way. So it could also be a threat of um, the validity you were expecting because suddenly uh, the group decides, you know, you're an adult uh, and they are teenagers, they're not talking to you. Okay, there goes your research. <laughs> but you have to take this into account. Of course, this can happen with any age group, but um, for children, it's a bit more complex in a sense. And the group dynamic can be, become more important than the content. So, for example, 
uh, boys against girls. So you have, um, I had this experience with a focus group of 15 year olds and suddenly the boys were picking on one specific girl. And it was not about having arguments or developing further on the content of the focus group. It was just being against this one um, girl. Again, this is very problematic and you have to intervene. So what we see here, if you look at strengths and weaknesses, it's actually the interaction amongst participants that is on both sides underlying the strengths as well as the weaknesses. Potential limits to using focus groups with children, particularly younger children, are that you need very specific skills that even go beyond the skills you need for interviews. In self-promotion, narration and argumentation together with cooperativeness. So you need a very high level of motivation and all sorts of other skills for a focus group to work in a sense, we conceptualize it methodologically. So if you want to take yourself back as a moderator and let the peers interact in the group, you assume that they can, that they don't need your help. This becomes very problematic when you're interacting with younger children. They might not have the skills to coordinate the communication. But I'll come back to that in a minute. It's the right time to talk about skills and competencies. So what seems most relevant to interview and focus group research in terms of skills are verbal, interactive, and cognitive skills because they determine the potential insights. So what is it you can gain as an insight from this research? what method is applicable and how can you use these data collection methods in the best way, all depends on these skills. Also important to remember skills change across childhood. They don't remain the same. And even within one age group, you might have a great variability of skills. From my research, I would say that the most important skill or developmental achievement in childhood is the ability of perspective taking. It's also linked to the decentration of thinking. So in other words, for the children to be able to understand what their interaction partner thinks or why they act the way they do. So taking the perspective of the other. This is very relevant because it increases the communicative competence. Uh, they can take previous knowledge into account. They can take interests and expectations and motives into account that can estimate um, what the other person might be thinking and therefore the communication becomes more relevant and more smooth in a sense. Um, and then generally the interview in the focus group is easier to follow. You need less questions, you need fewer questions for understanding the meaning. When I said negotiating meaning or equivalence of meaning, it becomes easier with that specific skill of perspective taking. Okay, this was a, just a brief introduction. Now we go into detail with a few examples to make it more tangible. <laughs> so we start with the verbal skills. This is a table, don't be scared. I'll take you through it um, on verbal skills. You see age groups here, and of course it's not, they're overlapping, I'm well aware. <laughs> the age groups are overlapping here. Uh, the reason why they are overlapping is that it's not so neat. It's not clean cut between these age groups. So don't take this too seriously. <laughs> it, the content is very serious, but the age groups, you know, they, they vary because the skills within one age group, as I said earlier, can vary to a huge degree. Um, but basically, having an idea of what goes on um, at a specific age, you then target your approach for interviews or focus groups based on this understanding. So I find this really helpful. Now, what you see here in the first um, half of the table, the verbal skills, you see for the younger ones, so below eight or nine, I would say, it's the idiosyncratic use of language. This implies that when you're a stranger, you're not sharing um, uh, life context with these children. It might be difficult for you to understand because they have specific expressions they use in the family and therefore it's difficult for you to understand if you're not a, member, a family member. A problem that is actually applicable for all age groups here is the problem in expressions of frequency and quantity. 
it improves from about nine, 10 years old, it becomes uh, less of a problem, but still it remains um, problematic. So if you wanna know something about frequencies or quantities, maybe you find another way of finding out um, than asking children. The gaps in vocabulary or the literal understanding versus the unspecific use of language is only problematic for some children when they are in, in primary school or beginning of primary school age. And then this becomes less of a problem. The verbal skills become better and better. They have a bigger um, vocabulary they can use. And they also show complex trains of thoughts. Um, here, the communicative skills are interesting because explanations are important for our understanding. You know, when we know about uh, the life worlds of children, they have to explain what they experience. It's not just a description, they need to explain things. Now for that, again, you need skills. Um, for the younger ones, it was actually many of times quite difficult to understand, to follow their train of thought. What are they trying to explain? <laughs> so you need to ask a lot of follow-up questions to actually follow. But when they get older, it becomes much more structured, much more reproducible. And at the age group of 10 to 12, they even use examples to illustrate. And they can read your face as well. So when you still have question marks in your eyes, when you're talking to them, they, they get it. You know, they tell you more examples, more details for you to follow. So as I said, to make it more tangible, um, some examples from my own research. This uh, five-year-old boy says sometimes always in the evenings. Obviously a problem with the frequency here. But you see it all through the age groups. Uh, like this nine-year-old girl says, mm, I don't know, they all taste good. Only some don't. Okay, forget the quantities, forget, forget the frequencies, but it's the same problem or almost the same problem when you talk to adolescents and when you talk to adults. Just look at transcripts of qualitative interviews and you'll see the same quotes will appear there. So don't blame the children. <laughs> Okay, then um, the idios idiosyncratic use of language. This is one of my favorite examples from a seven-year-old boy. It's about shopping. What would you buy if you go to the supermarket was the general question. Don't need to go in more detail. And he said, uh, then sticks. And I'm asking, what kind of sticks? Pretzel sticks? No, I mean, it can be pretzel sticks. So he felt guilty of saying no to me. <laughs> but then he still, you know, the, the suggestiveness, suggestiveness, um, is taken back. He says no, but then, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, maybe yes, but then he still says what he actually meant or something to drink that kind of sticks. A stick to drink? Yes, such a um, pipe stem. Hmm? <laughs> I just need to put it in your mouth. Ah, a straw. Yes, he meant a straw. So I called it a stick and, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, <laughs> difficult things. But this is exactly what I mean by you need to negotiate the meaning. You have to have the flexibility in your methods to actually find out what they're talking about. And another example, they call it a favorite series as well as a favorite episode. It's the same thing for them. A favorite film or a favorite tape, same. So unspecified use of language. Uh, and this, again, very literal understanding. <laughs> you don't have a cold anymore, I'm asking. Uh-uh, we are glad about that. And how was nursery today? I didn't go to nursery. Really, why did you not go to nursery? Because I have a fever. Ah, so you're being ill. Yes. <laughs> okay, no cold, but a fever. All right. <laughs> so you need to engage in the communication process, really. That's the, the bottom line. Uh, for the interactive skills, you see um, that's closely linked to this perspective taking and decentration of thinking. And you can see from the development of empathy, it moves on to greater self-awareness, um, which then also changes not just the self-awareness, but also impression management and social desirability. Because if you have an idea of um, yourself, who you are, what your preferences are, and then you learn to charge or estimate the other person, suddenly something like impression management becomes available and maybe even important. So all these skills can also have a negative side, data quality, 
for quantitative studies. In the qualitative, you don't have to worry too much about it. Just keep it in mind for the older ones that can become relevant, but you'll find out anyway in the process of talking to them. Um, and what you see in the lower part here is more relevant for the focus groups because the cooperation and compromise skills just develop in, in that age group, um, which means for focus groups, you have to be more active as a moderator in a sense, because they cannot um, channel and organize the cooperation on their own that well. And also this is quite interesting. They have much more social emotional behavior. So joy and anger and frustration at the same time, <laughs> many of times. So you have to be prepared for that. You need to um, counterbalance these sometimes stressful uh, situations for the participants. And then when they're a bit older, they have much better emotional self-control and it becomes less of a problem and the conversation is more focused on the content rather than content and emotions on top of it. Some examples, uh, perspective taping, they had um, a picture story and they were asked, would you do the same if you were in their shoes? Um, do you think those two enjoy shopping without their mom because it was two kids in the supermarket? Yes, yes, why? I don't know. What is it they might like? Because they can take what they like. Okay, that's very basic. It's just repeating, in a sense, obvious <laughs> points. And then it becomes more elaborate here, a nine-year-old girl. Can you imagine what they would put into their shopping trolley now? Hmm, maybe not necessarily what their mom wants. Maybe sweets or something like that. Uh -huh. And maybe fruit, a few pieces, but not too much. <laughs> So you see uh, definitely the development from five to nine here. 11 year old girl, what do you think they get there? Hmm, maybe lollies. And this girl was looking intensely at the pictures for the picture story to find out are there any clues to, to find out what I want to hear as a researcher. And then Haribo, chocolate, hmm, maybe something to nibble. Uh huh. Something specific. Uh, crisps is a big question mark. <laughs> and this is what I said about the perspective taking, and then it becomes a, an issue of social desirability as well. And um, now this or these examples I just showed you were on a specific um, task where I asked them to take the perspective with the picture story, but also outside this very specific task where they, I, I tried to trigger the perspective taking. I could see um, signs of this decentration, like this um, boy, seven, says, if you want to know everything that, if you want to know what we like, we as children, then you always have to watch children's stuff, right? And that was actually quite clever. Yes, you have to know what they're talking about. You have to know what are their favorite series, what are the gadgets they might use in our research context. Now, otherwise you, well have a difficult time to understand maybe. <laughs> so, and the last one are the cognitive skills. Um, cognitive skills here, I just focused on logical thinking and reasoning. And you can see that the relations they, they have between concepts are vague and then they move to trial and error and then eventually um, based on similarities. And also the logical thinking, of course, becomes much better, more complex and more flexible. And for the reasoning, it also becomes more differentiated. So an example, um, this was an, an association task. So I gave them well, a picture or a word and they had to give me the associations they have with this whatever item. In this case, it was Nutella, so a chocolate spread. Could milk go with chocolate, uh, chocolate spread? No, mm -hmm, why not? Because that is white and Nutella is brown. You found that quite often, it's very unidimensional. They just focus on the color of something. And this is the logic they apply to every other question that comes after that. So you see, you, you're not getting a lot of insights from this, not necessarily. Then a seven-year-old girl, uh -huh, what is it? Why is it not very healthy for the teeth? Because that is sweet. Uh -huh. And it's likely that there is sugar in it. Yes, likely, right. And sugar destroys the teeth. 
So that's a proper reasoning, you know, going through all the motions, going through the steps and explaining the conclusion here. So it's actually quite good. And then this I like very much, 11-year-old uh, boy. Uh, there was um, an ad for Nutella for the chocolate spread with um, football players in Germany. Uh, they somehow created Nutella, these athletes. Uh -huh. Do you think that athletes really eat Nutella or is, it, is this only in the ad? I think that they do eat Nutella because for Kurani and Hinkel, two football players, it says in Bravo Sport, it's a magazine for young adolescents, that they eat a lot of Nutella. Uh -huh. I think they do, except for if it was a lie, but I don't think so. The magazine cannot lie, can it? <laughs> oh, where do you think there could be the connection? Why do athletes like eating Nutella? What could be, hmm, because they might like it best or, mm -hmm. so actually by talking, he now realizes, hmm, there might be something wrong. I haven't thought about that, but he doesn't verbalize, but you can see that actually the logical thinking process is now on the move. <laughs> okay, so a short, a short um, excursion to, I don't know, developmental psych psychology, applied to interview research and now coming back to practical implications. So what does all this mean if you are now preparing your field work with young children, either interviews or focus groups? Okay, let's bring it together. For the setting, a recommendation would be to avoid any setting that is like a school because you have a very strong power imbalance in school settings. And this is what you don't want in an interview. You want to empower them. You want to tell the children that participate that they are the experts. They should tell you and explain you what is important for them and not the other way around. So you have to use everything you can to make sure they understand they are the experts. This also includes you're not going to have a, a teacher-student um, setup in terms of you're sitting on the desk and the child is sitting next to you on the smaller table, obviously. <laughs> so use an environment that is familiar, friendly, and warm. I'm actually freezing. It's snowing outside. Warm sounds good. <laughs> so greetings from Vienna. <laughs> the room should be bright and friendly and avoid distraction, particularly for younger children. If it's a new room they have not been to and it's full of toys, they are they need half an hour to find out what toys they can find. And then they might or might not focus on your attempt to have an interview with them. Just keep that in mind. If the children are not familiar with the room, give them the chance to look around um, and also show them where the bathroom is. <laughs> this might be relevant. Um, what I found in a nursery, they offered me a gym to do the interviews. This was actually problematic in the sense that the children thought well, this is the gym, we're now in the gym. We're jumping around, aren't we? Well, no, <laughs> you can also jump around, but it's not very helpful when I'm trying to tape the interview. <laughs> so just try and um, figure out what the rooms are used for in everyday life if you're going to school or nursery, which is the most convenient usually, but now in a global pandemic, I'm very restricted, unfortunately. Uh, for younger children, you can use seat cushions instead of chairs that might be um, more relaxed for them. Also sit on a cushion instead of on a chair, obviously. Um, and if you have an assistant, the person should be in the background. And also uh, children usually don't want to sit for too long. So it's a good idea to give them the opportunity to also get up and, and do something, put a sticker on the wall, even if it's something simple like that, to interchange the sitting, walking, um, playing, drawing, whatever activities you're using to make it more interesting. Um, as for the recording devices, just show it to the children, give them the chance to play with it, to maybe play back to them. So then it doesn't become a problem. It doesn't disturb the situation. It doesn't distract them. They are perfectly fine with smartphones, the recording or camcorders or whatever you, you're going to use. Just give them the chance to, to see it and touch it, and then they're going to be fine within no time. 
Conversational rules use simple language, obviously, unambiguous and straightforward language would be helpful. Avoid passive voice, use words from the children's own experience. Avoid the use of pronouns, use names instead. Be aware of the idiosyncratic use of language and ask for clarification when necessary. Questions on frequency and quantity are notoriously unreliable. So if you really have questions like how many hours do the children watch TV a day, maybe you want to ask the parents rather than the children. Um, ask only about one concept per question and avoid negatives as in, did you not see who it was? And no tag questions like, this is a daddy doll, isn't it? The literal understanding of language might also be a problem, but all this can be avoided easily by just engaging in a, in a proper conversation. It's not a unidirectional um, process of talking to each other. It's a true conversation where um, everybody participates and contributes, and then you'll be fine. Um, yeah, the lack of equivalence of meaning might be a problem. And do not use baby talk. You're just making yourself ridiculous. <laughs> They're not going to take you seriously. <laughs> they don't believe you uh, use baby talk in everyday life. And it just gives them the impression you're not taking them seriously. So stick to your own um, language. It has to, to sound and appear natural. And um, a lesson I learned, uh, avoid jokes because they don't get it. You find it funny, they don't. <laughs> can be quite uh, frustrating, particularly figures of speech. Um, and irony is something that young children don't share with us as adults. Keep eye contact, but don't stare at them all the time. Every now and then just interrupt and look away um, to, to relax, to give them a little bit more leeway. And anything that reminds them of a school interaction should be avoided. So asking questions like, what is asthma? How did you get there? assume that there is a right and the wrong answer and like the question on the asthma it also suggests that you already know the answer and you're just testing their knowledge and this is not very helpful in telling them that they are the experts of their life roles and you're really interested in their perspective and not your own so this is what you have to remember and you have to make sure that this is conveyed in a credible way so the role of a moderator or the interviewer is to listen be attentive and demonstrate attention through your body language. Clarify many times if necessary that there are no right and wrong answers and treat the participants as experts in their own right. Establish rapport before starting off and give a structure but also maintain focus. Without being too strict, be supportive and empathetic. Active listening, obviously. Do not lecture and do not judge children, but keep an open mind and they open up and you'll be surprised and um yeah you'll find out a lot of things they know and great pleasure actually to research young children never jump to a conclusion too soon <laughs> flexibility i would say is really the key to success and expect the unexpected give the children the room to express themselves in their own pace and mode and you will be surprised how much you can learn. That's a promise I give you. And I'm happy to hear your questions or comments uh, later on. Now you get a few comments from my colleagues from the grounds. <laughs> Thank you, Susanna, for uh, highlighting some of those essential points for doing research with children. Um, and as you indeed mentioned, our researchers are out in the field um, and we've asked a few of them to give some insights into their experiences um, from Norway, Romania, Estonia and Austria. And uh, we'll start with um, Maria Rot, who is a researcher at the Cluj University in Romania. Uh, she'll tell us a bit more about doing research uh, with children in disadvantaged families any experiences of the field research uh, in Romania. Uh, after Maria, we will hear from Marika Sisask, uh, Professor of Social Healthcare from the Tallinn University in Estonia. From Norway, we have Tove Lafton joining us, Associate Professor 
at Oslomet, uh, and she will give us insights into the work uh, they've done in Norway. And then finally, we'll also ask Eva Maria Schmidt from the Austrian Institute of Family Studies in the University of Vienna to tell us a bit about her experiences. But uh, Maria, we'll start with you. Thank you very much. I hope you hear me well. I'm um, from Romania, as you said, from Babes Boyer University. And uh, I'm very glad that you accepted me as a presenter in this panel. So I will talk about the DigiGen research with young children in disadvantaged families. Uh, my topic is about the importance of contextualizing when we do research with children. So uh, one of my starting points would be the Children's Rights Convention, which uh, states, as you already he heard, that uh, children are competent agents who have the right to participate in research. And researchers' role is to make sure that children are well taken care of during the research, the best uh, interest of the children is respected and ch children are not supposed to any harm. So when we talk about well-being and ch disadvantaged children, uh, we think that uh, children, we, we have to take care that children have eaten, are not thirsty, are well, uh, the, um, the surroundings, the uh, place where we are working with children in the research uh, is safe. Yes, and there is something more in uh, the CRC. It says that part, uh, participation in research should be fair, ethical, and inclusive, meaning that uh, research has to cover a large variety of contexts where research is taking place, as children are very different, as childhoods are very different in all of our countries. So different um, competencies of children uh, are uh, depending a lot on the surroundings, on uh, what, are, what is the context that can facilitate or can uh, inhibit uh, the development of um, competencies. So what I mean by disadvantaged children, disadvantaged children are coming from uh, families with low income, with bad housing circumstances, with uh, uh, little or no family support, lack of low quality, lack or low quality health and education services, or different forms of exclusion from community because of race, because of ethnicity, because of disability, or other minority issues. So uh, children, Disadvantaged children usually come from disadvantaged families and uh, in uh, disadvantaged families and disadvantaged communities, there are often not only one uh, risk factor, but multiple risk factor. And the more these um, risk factors are there, uh, the more the uh, disadvantages for the children. So what research tells us is that uh, disadvantages are cumulative. So um, why me from Romania is dealing with uh, this issue of, of, of research, of qualitative research with uh, disadvantaged children? It's not a surprise because uh, Romania has um, to deal with lots of children from disadvantaged situation. Um, what does it mean to explore digital competencies in a marginalized community, in a uh, disadvantaged community? So uh, why we are involved in this topic, in this research? Because we think to, that we need to give children the right to express their views, as only by hearing their voices can we understand children's needs and wishes. We can fight prejudices, and we can include their opinions in the research finding. And only if we have their opinions in the research findings can we formulate inclusive policy suggestions. So again, coming back to, to Romania, Yes, uh, there are 
very different childhoods in Romania. I will not talk about them, that's just reminding you from this, this, these, these pictures. And um, uh, Romania, as all the other countries in the world now, uh, access to digitalization has increased a lot. Children are um, using technology. The majority of children are using technology in the diverse forms. Uh, online schools have accelerated the use of digital technologies. So um, digital uh, gadgets uh, have penetrated children's lives in very, very different ways. But as um, I already told you, Romania is a country with uh, um, high disadvantages for some of the children. So child poverty in Romania is the highest in the Euro European Union and in among the OECD countries since uh, almost um, 30 years since we measure it. Uh, so uh, there are plenty of um, opportunities to examine what does uh, research with children um, mean in, uh, um, for children from disadvantaged families. So one of the research questions that we have is this, in this DigiGen project is how does digital technology fit in such kind of communities? Uh, what is its role in children's lives coming from um, this kind of communities? And in uh, Babesboy University in, in Cluj, we have the opportunity uh, to, to do research in uh, such a community, which is very close to our city. Cluj is the second biggest city in Romania. And 15 kilometers away, we have uh, this uh, Patarut uh, community um, with um, approximately 2,000, 2,500 people, and probably one third of them are children. So um, there are lots of challenges. As um, you already heard before, there are lots of challenges in uh, working uh, with um, little children, with young children, and some special challenges when doing research and interviewing with and qualitative methods with disadvantaged children. Um, methodologically, working with young children living in poverty needs preparation, of course, like for any other kind of research. Um, but we ha have to be prepared that children might have delayed language development or because they might be from minority, um, uh, then they might not know the language or not know well the language. Uh, children might not be familiar with the way uh, the researcher looks like or behaves or is dressed or especially how, how the researcher speaks. Uh, children might not be familiar with technology in our case. Yes, we, they might not uh, know that these devices and because we used a lot of images when um, um, interviewing children, uh, we might be aware that uh, children are uh, not uh, understanding or not, not used to those uh, schematic sketch-like uh, drawings that we are using. Um, what we learned doing interviewing with uh, ch young children from these disadvantaged communities, uh, we learned that children want to be engaged in research. This is a very important issue that they want to participate and uh, also that parents their parents uh, accept that they take part in research uh, so parents consent to it but only if the researcher is sufficiently respectful to them and um, um, explains to the parents about confidentiality because uh, children or and their parents need to know that the way we are doing the research will not uh, have any bad consequences on, on children and their images will not be 
shown to others. Apropos, I have to tell you that all the images that I use are not from our research or the uh, pictures that I uh, use here in this presentation are not taken while we are were doing interviewing, but were, um, I, I took them randomly from the internet. But some of the pictures are from the community I was speaking to you about. So we also had to negotiate the uh, research appropriate space because this is a problem. Uh, many of the children had only um, li were living in a shack and uh, only had one room where all the family lived. So it's a not so easy to do uh, a research with one child uh, who, when he or she is surrounded by uh, smaller brothers, toddlers, or parents. Um, we have to take into account that not all children that we are approaching can voice their opinions, but uh, be sure that some do and let them ask questions. So the researcher might need to invest in exploring children's opinion beyond the first response. You already heard that we need to ask uh, for explanations from the children. So, and let them sometimes take the initiative. I was especially touched by uh, one boy's uh, present uh, responses, uh, where from I understood um, many things about what means um, research, interviewing a young boy aged nine. So I will try to read you some fragments from his uh, um, responses. Uh, so he's a young boy, Gabriel, uh, a Roma child living with his stepmother and younger brother, a toddler brother, who is two. And the father uh, is in the UK working uh, there. Um, he has migrated for work, came back, and for his birthday, for the Gabriel's birthday, uh, he brought a console to Gabriel. So when we asked, uh, what about this image? It's a console. Have you ever held one in your hands? Yes, I had two. And what, uh, uh, and now do you have any? No, because uh, he, um, so one of the consoles had, had a little bit broken. So he uh, sold the consoles uh, when um, the father couldn't come back anymore during this um, COVID times, couldn't travel home, they needed money. So uh, selling uh, this valuable gift that he had was a way it, it helped uh, surviving uh, his uh, family. Uh, in the rest, he was telling that he used every social media uh, that other children are using or we are using. So what do you think we have here? Facebook and what can you do with Facebook to put a profile picture to look at what people upload and what do you upload? Posts, uh, barbecues, singing Christmas carols, he said. And do you have uh, Facebook friends? Yes, how many? Lots of friends. So all the things that others do. So which shows us that even the circumstances of lives are very diff difficult. Um, digitalization penetrated this community. So <clears throat> research with um, young children in this disadvantaged community has benefits. In our research, we saw that it promoted digital technology competencies in the community. So after we did a focus group in a kindergarten, with, uh, which is like a short start or something like that um, for preschool children uh, from this community. The manager of the center talked to us about the need to put more emphasis on digital literacy. Then uh, during this um, research, children connected to kind and understanding adults. And also these, um, adults, the master students and the research, young research assistant who went to 
interview these children, made a connection with them, with the children. So it was um, a gain situation. Um, so in the focus group, the children learned a model <clears throat> of a respectful group communication, which was important for them. <clears throat> of course, the setting of the kindergarten was not ideal. Sorry. I have to <clears throat> because of the COVID situation, we had to respect to stay at distance from each other and they couldn't move around as they wanted. But the way we tried, we managed to, to uh, ask the questions and responses, it was respectful and, and the children liked it. <clears throat> so um, for children, it, when we praise them that they give good responses and we understand them was also a way to um, to feel respected and raise self-esteem other takeaways from um, uh, further research and for theorizing for example um, we have to understand after doing this research that there are social context driven delays and gaps in the development of digital competencies and um, we have to bring these results in uh, and show them in uh, our papers and uh, transmit them um, and work with them for the policy uh, changes that we recommend. Then digital technology penetrated the most disadvantaged community in a context specific way. So we have to acknowledge it is there, even if the images don't show it, but when we ask questions, we were surprised how much uh, these uh, gadgets and technologies are already there. And of course, online school helped and um, that um, um, all, um, government um, helped children get some tablets for online school. This um, help them uh, get used to it, and it was important. Uh, and of course, uh, for theory, we have to um, take a holistic approach, I think, and look on uh, digital competencies, not only as, as skills, but also as a way of life, as how this um, technology, these gadgets, these this objects, uh, make a value for the community members, can change the role and the status of the children, make children, for example, equal to um, a stepmother, the stepmother who broke her telephone and the ch child was so kind and allowed her, the stepmother, to use her telephone and took care of the little brother and told to the little brother stories. So this is the way that the child made a position in his uh, family and became ally with the stepmother so they could manage and survive uh, this uh, period, at least until now. These are the things that I wanted to tell you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much, Maria, for uh, sharing your insights and some of the examples of uh, the research in Romania. Um, I'd like to move on to Merika. Uh, um, could you tell us a bit about the experiences you've had uh, in Estonia while doing the field research with the young children? Thank you. Uh, in Estonia, we have been lucky. And despite the lockdown uh, due to COVID situation, we have managed to finalize our field work. And the situation is much worse now, and now we can uh, continue with analyzing the data. And um, we, I'm very grateful to all, all PhD students and master's students and interviewers who, who have been involved in this process. And myself, uh, I'm not an experienced researcher in, uh, with children. And uh, this was actually, for me, the first time to be involved in, in interviewing so small children. And I was so surprised and I was excited how collaborative and smart children are. And this is both in terms of 
awareness about the content, I mean, the usage of digital devices and apps, but also in terms of human relations, uh, which means that actually in this group work, you have to be very authentic and very honest to, to be taken seriously by, by children. And we had very clear and comprehensive manual for fieldwork prepared by Austrian team. But uh, today at the webinar, I would like to highlight uh, just some uh, selected observations about conducting uh, research uh, with children uh, based on the experiences that we obtained uh, from the focus groups, focus group interviews in Estonia. And these observations, they're not systematic. They are rather spontaneous kind of snapshots from, from uh, some interviews and they are all related to the process and not, not to the content of the interviews. So these are actually small details, but uh, sometimes uh, secret lies in, in details, and this can uh, influence the overall course of the interview. So first, um, informed consents. We considered it very important uh, part of the interview uh, that we inform children properly and we, uh, we ask them to try to sign the informed uh, content, uh, consent uh, just to show respect to our children at any age, even towards small children. Uh, we wanted to emphasize their agency and we prepared child-friendly consent forms uh, with pictures and everything. And, uh, we try to pass the information as clearly and shortly and as possible and ask to write their names on the concert form. And um, then you end up with a situation uh, where the whole preparation phase takes quite time. And uh, it seems that it's quite boring to children. And, uh, and during the first interview, you are not really prepared for this. And um, they, Children wanted to get feedback from moderator, how good they were in writing their names. They were not satisfied just to write their name. They wanted to show and ask, is it, is it okay? So, uh, and for example, for kindergarten children, they really get tired of a half an hour interview. And if you, if you waste so much time for, for informing and asking for consent in a very proper way, as you think it, it might be that children get, get tired before you get uh, to the point. So uh, it, this phase uh, uh, has, has to be very clear and short. Um, and these instructions are needed, but should be done as fast as possible. Then um, secondly, moderating the focus groups. Theoretically, we know that uh, the focus group moderators shouldn't be too directive or authoritarian, but but um, with small children, it sometimes was difficult to choose not to be directive because the situation was different. And um, sometimes they are very talkative and, uh, and sometimes the group dynamics ends with interaction within the group where the moderator is still in the center also, you wanted to make them to interact with each, with each other. So uh, it's, um, sometimes it's difficult to find the balance, but you have to, have to find it because it's a key of good, good interview. And uh, sometimes the children need direct and clear instructions uh, to feel safe during the interview rather than uh, having too much uh, freedom and flexibility. Third, uh, how children reflect their experiences. Well, the aim of the focus group uh, uh, was to encourage children not to talk about their own individual experiences with digital devices, because for that we had individual interviews. But the aim was to create stories about shared experiences, uh, how it is in your age in general, but um, actually it was almost impossible to make small children these kindergarten groups to talk about experiences of children in their age in general. Now, they would like to share their own stories and everything they 
emphasizes related with their own life and own experiences, or sometimes with, with uh, related to close family members or close uh, friends. So express, expecting them uh, in kindergarten to express some general opinions, that, that is clearly too much. And uh, also it was sometimes difficult that to get these in-depth experiences on self-reflections. Small children tend to give uh, specific and direct answers. They not, do not generalize or talk in abstract level. Uh, fourth, we had very nice pictures for our interviews to facilitate the whole process because these pictures were very helpful while defining what we are talking about, what are these digital uh, devices, and really it was extremely helpful. But uh, it also some in some stages and, uh, caused some methodological challenges. For example, we had many pictures, then you had to find the balance between showing the pictures one by one or putting them on the table all together. If you chose this one by one um, option, it was quite time consuming. Again, again, the time was limited. Or if you put the pictures on the table all together, then it caused confusion and uh, the interviewees uh, didn't know exactly what about they should talk right now. And uh, we had also situation cards with different situations where digital devices were involved in, in family situations. And um, we used smiley faces and colored stickers. And um, uh, the situation cards themselves, they were very clear and useful, but this assessment part actually where children had to show if they liked the situation or neutral, uh, they are neutral or they don't like the situation. It didn't work out so, as smoothly as we wanted because uh, it was a bit complicated for, for the children uh, to, to process all this information that they had to keep silence first and then put the sticker and then, uh, then uh, think and then answer, but not all together, but, uh, but one by one. So uh, they, small children, they lost their patience and they liked more to play with the stickers put on the nose and on the hands and everything. So again, it was fine and fun, but it took quite time, valuable interview time. And uh, last, the use of language. Uh, Susanna already talked about it, uh, uh, how important it is, uh, how children who understand what meaning children give to, to words. And uh, we, I think we manage well with uh, making a common understanding what is uh, what the digital device is. But for example, in one interview, uh, it was really surprised that you think you are well prepared. And in this focus group in school, we uh, introduced ourselves uh, and said we are investigators from Tallinn University meaning that we are investigators, the researchers. And after the, the end of the interview, or at the end of the interview, we asked children if they have any questions. And uh, it turned out that they understood that we are investigators, but, but, we are, but that we are police investigators. And can you imagine? Uh, I can't imagine. <laughs> it's really difficult to imagine how it might influence the whole interview. Uh, but they talked very freely, so uh, actually it made, made me think that uh, how vulnerable people, children can be, that even if they thought we are police investigators, and they didn't know what, why we are asking this, ask this question, they were very, very open. But uh, in this interview, a girl said very nice thoughts that, uh, uh, do you have a lab where you put children's thoughts so when we explained how we are doing our research, then they would really wanted to know what we will do next with their thoughts. So uh, these are very briefly snapshots. And um, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Medica. This is, uh, I think, all very clear points on how important it is to really uh, fine-tune how you were working with really small children. Um, Tove, uh, your experiences in Norway, do they reflect somewhat uh, the same things as that Marika mentioned? 
thank you. Yes, uh, they uh, most certainly reflect some of the same things, uh, but uh, also uh, different things in meeting the children in interviews. So uh, in my presentation, I uh, will share some of the experiences and reflections we have made in uh, Norway. And I especially want to share with you two of our experiences connected to using Zoom as a medium to interview children and the importance of the camera in the focus group interviews. I will build my reflections on some of the uh, things Susanna uh, talked about. So I will refer a bit to what she said in the uh, initial talk. So due to the COVID situation, restrictions have forced us in Norway to think differently about um, how have conducted three family interviews where we um, went home to the family and talked to the child and to the parents uh, in their own home. Then with uh, all the restrictions on how many guests you can have and yes, uh, other, we saw that we couldn't uh, continue doing our interviews in that form. So we decided to try, what if we try to do our interviews via Zoom? Uh, of course, this evokes several questions. Uh, and our first question was linked to whether small children would actually talk to us through such a media, if they would actually share anything, and if we as researchers could connect with them through the uh, screen. And that was a question uh, both asked by the researchers and by the parents in their uh, period of uh, giving consent. Um, however, uh, when doing the interviews, some of the adults or the parents were actually more uncomfortable with the medium than the children. The children themselves were quite relaxed. They, and surprisingly enough, it was not that hard to connect with them. But uh, I think much due to how we chose to stage it because we told the parent to uh, connect on Zoom together with the child so that they could both make sure that all the technical devices were okay and that uh, both the child and the parent could get to know the researcher a bit in the start. In some of the interviews, we also met up so that both the researcher interviewing, for example, the father, if he was the one who connected together with the child and the researcher uh, interviewing the child would all meet up in the same room at first so that we could talk and that the, also the researcher talking to the father could kind of show the face and say that, okay, I will talk to your father, but we won't start before you are safe and you say it's okay. And it didn't take very long. Before the children were okay, they said, this is fine, you can go, I can talk, this is okay. Um, and of course, it was a question about focus in the conversation. Uh, but that too was kind of, it was different. Some of the children talked a lot about uh, their experiences, what they used. And we could see that the children being in their own room and own environment uh, made them bring in stuff that they already had, like toys or other things that they were occupied with, to support them in talking. Some of the children only wanted to talk with us in like 15 minutes, and other stayed longer. And as the researchers interviewing the children have said, it was the most challenging job was actually to keep uh, the conversation going uh, and to find the right questions to kind of trigger uh, uh, the answers. But what we see in retrospect is that it's quite nice actually to have the, um, to have the uh, filming uh, of the Zooming conversation. And that is linked to uh, my second point uh, I would like to address and that's the um, value of the camera or the film 
in and into you. Because we can see that when we look into the uh, recording, we can see not only what the children are saying, but also how they say it using their body language in addition to the talk. And that is also became very clear in the focus group uh, that this is of great importance because uh, we had uh, lots of conversations in the focus group where um, it went like, uh, if you just would listen to the uh, recording, you can hear like, yeah, yes. And you know, I like this. Can you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I can see it. And if I do like, yeah, yes. Oh, I understand. Yes, if I do like this. And if you, as a researcher, want to kind of say that, oh, I'm going to make sense of the recording, then you actually account the whole variety on how children actually communicate with you. And in the uh, conversation I referred to, the children was talking about how they had seen sign language as a part of uh, children's TV uh, on YouTube. So they were talking about how they did use uh, these different devices. And then they were explaining how they developed their own signs when communicating together. And of course, to understand that, you have to include the signs. And the same thing was when they were talking about uh, telephones or like telephones, or if I had a telephone, I would do like this and they were like clicking. And during the conversation, they made visible how to interact with your telephone, how to kind of touch the screen, how to move your finger to make the telephone work, to kind of navigate in what the telephone or the iPad can give you access to. So I think that uh, for us um, as researchers, of course we can try to remember or make notes or, or say that, oh, this is like that. But just like Susanna said, being a moderator in a focus group together with children is about being present together with the children and interacting in the conversations all time long. So you really don't have time to take notes or to there and then like reflect on who, how is this connected to the rest of the society? Because you have to be in the conversation together with the children to elaborate on the themes that they bring up and that they present and, and choose to share with you. Uh, and to do that, you also have to be tuned into their body language uh, in addition to their verbal expressions because children's language probably is much more, much richer and much more complex than we sometimes think about language when thinking about adults or doing research together with adults. So all in all, uh, we are looking forward to diving into our um, films and trying to make sense of all these diverse ways of communicating and trying to identify what this actually says about the children's own, own voices in uh, what they think about technology, especially as a part of uh, family life. And as a last uh, comment, that was also something very interesting because when we came to the kindergarten, we were curious if the children would choose to actually tell us a lot about their digital practices in kindergarten, but they didn't. They were kind of prepared from the parents, from what we had sent out from the preschool teacher, that you just you are going to talk about how you use it at home or anywhere you can choose yourself. And these um, drawings that many of us have talked about kind of uh, made it visible for them. Like, what are we going to talk about and in what settings? So they really fast picked up on the line that we are interested in the family life. Um, and that's, uh, that was a surprising experience, I think. Yeah, I think I will end there uh, from the Norwegian team. 
Thank you so much. And uh, it's, it's very interesting to hear how much added value it has to have the recordings to really also analyze uh, the body language of, of the children. Um, before I move to Eva Maria, I just want to remind you that after Eva Maria's uh, contribution, we'll have some time to take a few questions. Um, you can find the Q&A tool uh, below in the tool bar. Um, so please feel free to send uh, any of the speakers a question or a question to all of us. Um, and we'll look into it uh, after Eva Maria. Eva Maria, do you want to share a bit of the reflections you have from the research in Austria? Yes, uh, thank you very much for this possibility. Um, so I will add some um, experiences or, or impressions from our field work in Austria, which have not uh, been mentioned so far. Um, there are, I think, uh, some points left. Um, let me begin with uh, recruiting. So due to the COVID restrictions, uh, re restrictions also in Austria, we had um, to uh, skip our plan to go to kindergartens and schools and um, conduct our focus groups there and um, conduct uh, recruited the, the children via gatekeeping parents uh, mostly, um, which, um, yeah, consequent, uh, as a consequence, um, we have found a lot of friendship groups. So when uh, parents invited their own friends, um, children are playing sometimes together, or when parents invited uh, friends of their children, um, we had to deal with um, very strong friendships groups most of the time, which are fine in general. Peer groups are fine in general, also with um, uh, younger children. But sometimes uh, these friendships might be too close um, and it might be um, difficult uh, as it might influence also the group dynamic. Um, so people, uh, the children are uh, playing then the roles they're used to play when they are with their friends, for example, acting very aggressively uh, with each other or yeah, playing certain kind of games. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, this was sometimes a little bit difficult, so we would suggest to avoid these really strong friendship groups um, in the future. Uh, although peer groups are fine at, um, in general. Um, originally, we had planned to um, come together with kind of six to eight children in one focus groups, but uh, in one focus group, but we only had the chance to, um, on average, um, recruit four um, children in the focus groups in which we found worked really well. So we um, had the experience that these uh, four children together in one room sitting together um, or around a table are really enough uh, also for the moderator um, to um, yeah, stay on, on track with those uh, children and, and keep them concentrated and keep them also, uh, give them also the possibility to, to talk um, as long as they like or to talk about things off topic, which I will talk about later. Um, some words on the, on the methods we used. So you already heard that we used um, um, show cards on the one hand where we showed some pictures from digital devices. Um, to talk with the children about. And we also um, showed some cards with uh, situations on it, where we tried to um, elaborate with the children what they see, if they like what they see there. For example, one situation where parents sitting with, or not parents, but adults perhaps sitting with uh, two children around a table where some ate um, something and another child was playing something, maybe a tablet, maybe a smartphone. And we tried to um, discuss these uh, pictures with the children. And we also had the impression that um, sometimes these uh, faces lasted too long. So we decided to group some cards or perhaps we will also try out to make some, some um, other fun activities. For example, let the children draw something or yeah, we have to think of it. So there are some kind of modifications also um, that take place during the uh, phase of conducting focus groups, uh, especially when you conduct focus groups or interviews with young children. What also was interesting that some children might not recognize the picture drawn on the on the card, but maybe they would have recognized it when we had the real device with us. For example, they didn't recognize the smart reader, but maybe they would have recognized it if we had a Kindle with us and, and uh, showed them. Um, 
what else uh, researchers have to be aware that children might also um, come to some discussions of topics. So they might discuss about their uh, other devices they have, like alarm clocks uh, they have on their own or some pictures they have on their walls. <laughs> um, yeah, and the, uh, the moderator then has to take uh, or have to find a possibility to come back to the topic and um, yeah, lead the, the children back to, to digital devices, um, even though some might know less or have less at home than others. Yeah, this leads me to the next point, the group dynamics. We had um, sometimes um, really domi domination issues. So children who talk louder or children who are really dominant or le are leading the discussion, not necessarily because they have or know more, um, but perhaps because this is very, very topic centered, our uh, discussions, of course, and children who might not have or know much about digital devices might yeah, be excluded, not necessarily on purpose, but um, this might also be um, addressed or keep in, in mind by the researchers. Um, regarding the moderation of uh, such focus groups, um, we had really um, good experiences with a box um, I had with me where I um, had all my pictures inside and all my things for role play, for example, um, uh, some playing figures and also the incentives the children um, got at the end of the focus groups. And this was really the, the children were curi curious about it, what comes next uh, out of the box. And um, this whole story helped us to to keep um, the concentration and um, yeah, keep the people, uh, keep the children interested um, in what we're doing with them. I, I already talked about the, the central, or a lot of you talked about the central role of the moderator. Um, perhaps one, um, I want to add that the moderator always has to be also very um, aware that um, children are very sensitive or reacting very sensitive uh, um, regarding the words uh, one uses or an adult uses. So for example, I I was talking about, um, I was, uh, I'm reading on my smartphone when I played the role as a child uh, and the children were really confused. Why are you reading? Because in their um, um, perspective, uh, smartphones were not for reading, but they were for playing. But me as an adult were talking about reading on the smartphone, I don't know, news or something else. And so one has to be really aware that um, children might understand it really differently. Um, yeah, and some points regarding the, the setting, the, the focus groups or also the interviews take place. Um, um, as we couldn't um, uh, conduct the focus groups in institutions like kindergartens or schools as they really were restrictive regarding people from outside, uh, we conducted some of the focus groups in children's homes. And very, it was very problematic when um, uh, we entered the children's room, especially because they felt strange um, about all their friends being in their room now, but another person from outside leading or uh, taking a leading role and maybe disciplining them and asking uh, strange questions. So this um, was really uh, also to, to be aware uh, regarding the setting. Also, sometimes uh, parents were present. Um, this, of course, was uh, not only in, uh, in the focus groups, but also uh, during the interviews with the children. This, of course, was um, a kind of disturbing or, um, uh, yeah, shaping um, the data. Uh, but on the other hand, we also had some experience and reflection from the parents afterwards. So they acted as kind of assistant and told us afterwards, for example, oh, they were really impressed what children know. They didn't know that uh, they have such a great knowledge about digital devices, for example. Or they said um, only 30% is true what they said, for example. Yeah, these were some add-ons on all the other presentations from, from the Austrian team. Thank you. Thank you, Eva Maria. Um, I, I had to laugh a bit about the, the add-on of one of the parents that said only 30% is true. Um, I guess this comes down to uh, some of the reliability when you are talking with very small children, maybe. 
Um, so yeah, we would like to open the floor um, for uh, some questions. Uh, so please send them in the Q and A. We already got um, one question from uh, Hatla. Um, she's asking, what do you think is one of the major takeaway messages for researchers in terms of methodolo methodological development? For instance, for those um, who would like to do research with young children. Um, I don't know, Susanna or Olaf, uh, perhaps you want to take this question um, or if someone else, let me know. <laughs> I'm happy to start and invite everybody else to contribute because I think uh, we all have our lessons learned. <laughs> um, I think the, the key thing is take advantage of the high motivation. Generally, kids are super motivated to contribute to our research because it's very special. They feel special. We are listening to them. You know, we want to hear what they have to say. And this is something that they really appreciate. So that's a good starting point. Uh, what Marike said, I, I can only um, underline, don't bore them with too many formalities and forms and, and things. <laughs> Maybe postpone this for, for later. So keep the excitement in the situation um, for them to participate. But also if some kids might not be very talkative, might not open up, that is okay too. Um, it might be the interview format as such. It might be the situation that is not working for them. Uh, and it's okay. Um, it's, it's not a problem. Other kids will tell you. You cannot force them. And you shouldn't, of course, and you will not try. I know you will not try. Um, something you could try, um, but this requ requires experience and flexibility, is just move away from, from what you plan. So instead of coming up with your interview guideline, do something totally different. Uh, let them go along and play with their Playmobil figures or uh, let them draw something if they feel like drawing. That's perfect. Just warm up and then they might um, volunteer to share some other insights or talk about the picture they, they drew and they might still be relevant for um, your research question. So in other words, be open for diversity. I was just going to say in the same direction. I think for me, the, the, the major takeaway is um, that you as a researcher have to be flexible and modify and not stick to your research questions so much. Um, literally, because that for me, take the challenge that whatever the children present their data to you, that you as a researcher have to take the challenge to see what is the input, what is the information, what is the data about I'm getting out of the focus groups or of the conversations of the children. So that might be different from an interview or a focus group you're having with adults, because there you can be very sticking to your research questions and to the questions you are having for your research. I think with children, you have a little bit, you have to be more flexible in terms of what do that they really tell me? What do they really show to me? And Ninka was mentioning the word the reliability. I often made the experience with interviews with children on the focus group one big challenge is if, if parents are present, like for the focus for the interviews with five-year-old ones, often it was important for the uh, for the child that the parents is present with the interview. So then the question of reliability came up to me as a researcher. If the children were telling a story and I was tended to ask the mother, is it true? And then it was really reflecting on my attitude towards the children. Can I really believe what the child is telling me? That they have no conflict about using digital devices in the family? It's hard to believe, but it's more questioning myself and my attitude than questioning what the child tells me. So we have to be open and flexible in how to interpret it and what we get out of the data. If I may add... Uh, regarding the, how to facilitate uh, the process of interviewing so that uh, children uh, start talking. Uh, for me, uh, I was um, before interviews, as I said, I'm not experienced. And before interviews, my biggest uh, fear was that they will not tell anything. And I am as a stupid uh, moderator sitting there and asking my questions and they will not talking to me. It was far from that. 
Of course, they are, their activity for different children is different. But um, what I wanted to say is that we had two very helpful tools. We talked about uh, pictures already, and these pictures were really nice um, because they were uh, quite, uh, they were not uh, pictures taken uh, from real life situations, but they were drawings so that um, I think children could project into these drawings their experiences. And as we saw, they told different stories based on the same pictures. But at the same time, the pictures can't be too abstract because then children don't understand what, uh, what they are about. So this help of pictures was huge. And the other tool that uh, we, I think we haven't talked about yet, there was a role play that we integrated one role play into our interviews. And this is also maybe some children uh, prefer um, commenting on, on, on the role play or start talking uh, uh, when, when they see this action, real action in their room. And it was also very helpful, yeah. Super. Well, we have quite a few questions coming into the Q&A, so I'd invite the, the panelists to take a look. Um, so we have one question, and I'll read it out. What is your opinion about interviewing small children in DIA? Sometimes this is advised to, do, to decrease the hierarchy between the adult researcher and, and the child. Any thoughts on that? Can I volunteer? <laughs> Please do. Um, yeah, that could be a good idea. Um, exactly for the reason you, you mentioned, to decrease the hierarchy. But uh, what I said about the focus groups earlier, that you have a dynamic in the group of participants, is also true for the diet here. Um, so that's just something to consider because it suddenly might become a conversation amongst the two friends. I mean, I assume you're talking about friendship pairs because if the kids don't know each other, you're not helping the situation. So it should be um, two friends that are participating. It may, might give them a sense of security and boost their self-confidence. So for that, it might be good. But um, yeah, just, just be aware in leading the conversation that they might go on tangents, in other words. <laughs> <laughs> because they're, you know, sharing their experiences, friends. And also what we saw in the focus groups, they might prefer playing or running around um, rather than spending time with you answering the questions. Yeah, pros and cons. Thank you, Susanna. Any more thoughts on that question? If not, we can shift to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think maybe I can ask this to Eva Maria, but the others are also welcome to answer. He's got a question uh, saying that when interviewing children, one might encounter a situation where they say things that might indeed not sound true to the researcher. Um, they might, for example, claim that they never break any family rules, uh, while in fact they might sometimes do. So how should researchers maybe proceed to use this data coming from the children uh, in such situations? Well, in general, um, I would suggest uh, to first of all believe the child or, um, or also give the child the security that we believe him or her. Um, for example, um, uh, I had some, a situation in a focus group where they kind of tried to surpass each other. So one talked about two tablets they have at home, the other one talked about 10 and the last one talked about 100. Of course, this is not true. And we also know this is not true. And also the children maybe know this is not true. Um, but then I think also during the analysis, you have to contextualize um, what happens before, what was said before, um, and what kind of meaning does this, um, yeah, um, how the child is wording it and how the child is, is um, discussing it or presenting it, what kind of meaning does it have for the child? So if ch children, which I also experience in general, do not experience conflicts with their parents regarding how, they, how often and how much they use digital devices, um, for them, there are no conflicts. They do not um, feel like there are conflicts. I really very seldom had experience from the children um, 
aged from five to 10, that they have conflicts with their parents. Rather, they have conflicts with their brother or with other, with friends um, who has, can use the tablet first or something like this, but not with their parents, interestingly. And yeah, we will, be, we will believe uh, this. It's the truth of the children. Olaf, yes, thank you. Yeah, Liz, I would like to add, because for me then, for me in that question, there's a very important ethical rule. I think we really have to be very conscious about in what kind of situation we bring children. So, I mean, it's not like, um, Medica said, we are not investigating, so we are not from the police. So I don't want to create a situation where the child after the interview gets in trouble with parents or his own conscience or whatever. So I think we have to be very aware that all the children we are talking to or working with are vulnerable in terms of that they are placed in specific situations, in a special family dynamic, in a special group situation. And we have to be aware of that. And it's our task not to put them in any kind of risk. And so even if I'm having the feeling maybe he, want, he, he doesn't want to be really honest with me, especially if the mother is sits next to him or the father is sitting next to the Zoom interview. So we have to be aware of that and we should not force children because maybe the um, harm will be greater afterwards. Super, that's a very important point. Yes. Can yes. I uh, make an addition as well? Because yes. I uh, uh, truly think was what uh, Eva Maria says is of great importance. And I think also we can see in interviews that children uh, same way as adults they tell us the story about their lives sometimes they tell us a story they want us to hear about who they are and what they do and what they like and what they can so and uh, in sometimes it might just if you see that children are making up and telling stories that are going way off in the imagination then maybe it's a kind of idea to go in like we do uh, talking to children in playing, like saying that, hmm, can we can we make some kind of sign? Can we just say that if we are talking pretend play, no? Can we just say that? Oh, and if I was like that, you could because you often change the way you speak when you uh, pretend and when you uh, tell the story. So maybe it's about the uh, kind of uh, you have to ask. Uh, the one interviewing the children, you have to uh, really uh, adjust to who they are sitting in front of you, I think. Thanks, Tova, for uh, elaborating there. I think all, both points, or all three points were very important on the ethics. I want to follow up immediately with you, Tova, actually, because we have a question in here about uh, experiences in relation to focus groups online and offline. Is there anything you might want to um, flag in terms of the pros and cons of this? How have you experienced the, the offline online? Oh, online? we have only done the one-to-one -one interviews online. So the focus groups, we have met up with the children. Uh -huh. So we really haven't the experiences in doing a focus group online. Even if we, if we suggested doing one with the eight to nine years old, uh, but I'm not, uh, I think it would have been really interesting to, to try it out. Uh, and uh, I think one of the most important things is to make sure that the children have someone around them, like a parent or someone, not to uh, be a part of the focus group, maybe sitting in the next room, but someone they can call if mm. they need help. And also, I think the role of the moderator is quite demanding in doing the focus group online. But uh, I think it can be done, especially with the eight to nine years old. Okay, thanks. That's a very positive feedback. Um, any other thoughts from the other panelists on that question? No, well, let's follow up then. Um, so we have a follow up question uh, on Andres's question about the statements not being true. Isn't this also the case when interviewing adults and general features of interviews? What you have data about is the statements of the interviewee, not actual practices. Any thoughts there? Well, just very briefly, but this is exactly what I meant. We are more challenged by um, questioning ourselves with children. We are not as researchers questioning as much, is this really true what that adult person is telling me? We just keep it as this is the data, just because children itself, they think so differently as Susanne was trying to tell that, we attend much more to questioning their, their answers. So of course it's the same like with adults, just totally can agree. 
Thank you, Olaf. Any more thoughts? Maria, do you want to share your thoughts? Uh, just unmute. I just need an unmute. Sorry. Okay. Hello <laughs> again. Sorry. Um, yes, sharing my thoughts about this. Uh, in this uh, DigiGen interviewing, we had one more option, one more possibility. After having the interview with the children, we had the possibility to ask the mothers. So we didn't have to confront the children. Mm -hmm. uh, is it that uh, you really don't have any conflicts with your parents about the rules that you use at home? But we had the possibility to ask the mothers how they see um, their relationship with uh, children around uh, using devices. Uh, so, um, of course, yes, we asked the children uh, when they said, uh, do you have conflicts with your parents about uh, using the telephone or the anything, any device? They would say no. And then we asked what, would, what are the norms that you respect? And they told us about the norms. So sometimes the word conflict means something different for them than the word norms, because they, they know the word norms and they can explain what are the regulations at home about uh, sleeping and uh, time to be on, uh, on social media, for example. And then uh, we let them be with that. And then we ask the parents and Surprisingly for me, often the parents would say the same things as children would say. I mean, doing family with the digital devices uh, seems to have a com uh, common denominator for the family members. So it looks like they, they agree on how they experience, how they feel about uh, these issues that we are investigating. I didn't sense major conflicts between them. I mean, it might be, but we didn't see major mm -hmm. conflicts between children's perceptions and uh, their parents' perceptions on, on this. Thank you, um, Maria, for the, the clarification. Indeed, the setup is really important and the moderation. Um, we have two more questions we'll take in the chat uh, before wrapping up. Uh, so we have one question. How, what method to use to control, manage their imagination during interview to make the interview more time efficient? Does anyone want to take that question? Do we want to control the imagination? That would be exactly my point. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> Why would you want to control the imagination? But Toby, sorry. Yo, no, no, no. Uh, and uh, both that and uh, the time efficient, I think, and this is uh, what Marika was saying as well. I don't think you can just uh, in advance say that this is going to take 30 minutes of my life as a researcher and then I will just walk out in the other end. Because I think that doing this research together with children, like taking them seriously is also about uh, making room for imagination and actually not being steered by these uh, time schedules or frames. Yeah. Thanks for answering that question. Uh... Last question, which I'll read out, which is in the chat. Is there sort of a magical amount of time that works best for the interview? How long have you found that is best to warm the children up, introduce and so on? And how long to get down to the topics? Uh, or do you tend to be fluid and try to get your questions in there as you go? Well, I can start a little. I think for the interview we saw for the small ones, I think you really have to differentiate between the five and six and the eight to 10 year old ones. For the small ones, you can see with five to six, half an hour is pretty long for the interview. And for the interview, children are really, really open and they step right immediately in. I think you really can start away. And with the focus group, since as like Eva Maria told me because of the COVID pandemic, we were working a lot with children which already knew each other. And our suggestion would have been as we planned for recruitment of children going via institutions like kindergarten that you make sure children have seen each other before because if they are completely strangers you would probably have to count a little bit more for warming them up in our ways there was no need for warming up they we could go straight to the uh, questions yes may i add something so introduce the introducing part the introductory part like introducing oneself myself and all the children uh, and introducing the study or something else. This also takes place much earlier when you come into the room or, yeah. 
So the warming up and um, also the, the conversation rules, for example, can also uh, can really be shortened um, very much. So it's important that children, um, yeah, that you can get the, the attention, the children's attention, their, uh, their curiosity uh, very soon. So maybe also the, the informed consent um, you can do at the end or um, or during um, the sometimes during the, the the focus group, for example. So it, it's important to be flexible, as everybody said uh, so far. I think. And maybe just following up on the uh, informed consent, because uh, to children it is hard to know what you are consenting to. You can be asked in advance, like, do you want to participate? Yes, of course I want to participate. Uh, and then they get into the room and they might just not want to participate at all. Uh, uh, so what uh, to make it like open, both to say that you can leave if you want to, but also like you suggested, Eva Maria, maybe we should just think that when the children come to the room, and have been told by their parents that uh, it's okay that you um, join this group. Uh, then they come in and they talk and we all address the questions. And in the end, we might just uh, do the consent form because then the children know what they have participated in, what they have answered, what they have told other people and what we will bring with us. So maybe that's also a ethical um, thinking about uh, how to think consent for, yeah. Thank you, Tove. Um, I think, unfortunately, uh, we're reaching the end of uh, our webinar today. Um, but uh, please do uh, continue the conversation on social media. Uh, you can find more information about our project on our website as well. Um, there, were, there was a question about the picture cards that were used in, um, in, the, inter, in the interviews in the focus groups. Uh, some examples are already available in our first working paper on uh, ICT use in the family. Um, and more of them will be uh, published uh, in our report later on. So you can have an idea of what they look like. They are made by our colleague Christa Hegan. Um, and they're actually quite nice, I think, uh, what we've heard from all the researchers. So thank you uh, to all the speakers for all your contributions and some insights into the many considerations when conducting research with children. And thank you all for tuning in and for sending us your interesting questions. Um, so as mentioned at the beginning, we've recorded the webinar um, and will probably in the coming weeks uh, publish that on our channel. If you enjoyed today's webinar, I warmly invite you to join us as well for our next webinars. We have one on 30 April uh, on digitally deprived children in Europe. And on the 26th of May, we have uh, one on the digital generation's political voices. Um, you can register through our website. And I would also like to ask you to save the date for the 22nd of June, where we will organize a full day policy forum uh, to discuss with a wide range of stakeholders um, how we can use our DGDM data for our future uh, policy and practice uh, engagement. Um, and I think uh, with that, I'll wrap it up. Uh, big thank you to everyone and um, have a good evening, a good night to some, and um, maybe see you in the next one. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.